Tonight, it's game three of a midseason series with the Mets. Games one and two showcased an Atlanta franchise full of resolve, resulting in a six-game win streak and a spot perched atop the National League East. Tonight, the Braves hope to make it seven straight with a series sweep. It's Braves baseball, and it's next on Sports South. The hottest day of summer is home to the hottest team in baseball. The Braves have won six consecutive games here in Atlanta. And they continue to lead the National League East and look for a sweep against the New York Mets. All year long, Braves baseball brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. The Braves are getting it done. They are taking care of business against the Mets and in the division. That's good news. We hope it continues tonight as we wrap things up with our friends from New York. Hi again, friends, along with Joe and John. I'm Chip. Welcome back to the ballpark where the Braves are winning baseball in a most unusual way. It's as easy, fellas, offensively as one, two, three. Well, there's no doubt. And sometimes in baseball, you need 25 guys throughout 162 season. But in this case, you really need the top of the order to do what they have been doing. And it's a big reason why they've been successful. It may not be a huge average at the top of the order, but it's been enough to create runs. This offense has always been judged on the home run. Can they hit enough of them? Well, they're showing lately they don't need the home run to score runs, and that is a pleasant surprise and why they're winning baseball games. Yeah, and the numbers don't lie, John, and just as you were saying, they've only hit two home runs during the six-game winning streak. Top of the order, a 260 average. Okay, that's nothing to get all excited about, except their on-base percentage is 100 points higher. They're drawing walks, they're getting on, BJ stealing bases, and they're getting a lot of clutch hits. They've scored 14 of the team's 32 runs during this streak, that says it all right there. And you know, Julio Tehran loves that kind of support. Hopefully he'll get some tonight as he tries to solidify what should be all-star game credentials. And Jen Hilbert is along for the broadcast as well. She'll talk about that when we come right back. Delta Airlines, 
and Ford. The Braves heating up right along with the weather. See if they can keep it rolling with a series finale against the Mets tonight. Hey guys, I'm Jen Hildreth at a very warm Turner Field. Now there are only four more home games left here, including tonight before the All-Star break. But certainly as a lot of players get a break, then you're kind of hoping tonight's starting pitcher for the Braves, Julio Tehran, will not because he has been pitching like an All-Star so far. You look at his ranks in the National League. He's top five in ERA, whip and hits for nine innings. Of his 17 starts so far, 15 of them have been quality. That ties for a first in the National League. And one of his catchers said, as far as All-Star goes, absolutely. I don't know. I mean, a 2-5 year array at the break, or I don't know what it is, right around there. I mean, he's probably been one of the best pitchers in the National League the whole first half, I think. If he doesn't make it, I think there's something wrong with the system. I mean, this kid has gotten better every year, um, every start, and he's obviously been one of our best pitchers in the first half. And uh, if he doesn't make it, I don't know what the All-Star uh, All game represents because he's uh, definitely an All-Star on our team, and uh, it'd be a great honor to, to be able to see him go out there and, and, and get something he deserves. Well said, Gerald Laird. Well, Christian Bethencourt will be behind the plate for Julio Tehran, who will make his first appearance of the season against the Mets. See if the Braves can keep up the streak with a sweep. First pitch on the way. Presented by the Georgia Lottery, Toyota, and AT&T, mobilizing your world. It is a hot, sticky night in Atlanta. A lot of fans have shown up for the finale between the Braves and Mets. We have an off day tomorrow, then the 4th of July weekend gets started here in Atlanta. And as hot as the weather is, the Braves fellas are even hotter. They're playing really good baseball. They've won six straight games and maintain a half game lead over the Nationals in the Eastern Division race. There you see the weather 92 degrees. Muggy is the forecast. And that's just how we like it here deep in the heart of the South with uh, Atlanta wrapping up this series with New York tonight. Expecting big crowds tomorrow, or excuse me, on Friday night for the fireworks display. Make your plans to get here early. Great fireworks show after the game. Between the Braves and the Diamondbacks. Good crowd Saturday and Sunday. Then we hit the road. Fellas, we head to New York and then the Cubs. And then all of a sudden, the All Star break is upon us. And when you have a good team playing good baseball, that first half, fellas, seems to fly right on by. Well, that and sometimes the off days you don't really want. And tomorrow might be one of those. You're playing yeah. hot and you're winning a lot of games. You want to keep on playing, but hopefully that will be just a blip and uh, 
like you said, they can take care of business tonight and get that rest and go on from there. And who better to do that than Julio Tehran? He'll face this Mets starting nine as presented by their skipper, Terry Collins and Toyota. New look at the top of the order. Eric Young is leading off. Curtis Granderson's hit a couple of home runs in the series, so he moves to the cleanup spot ahead of Eric Campbell, who's had a good run over the last week offensively for the Mets. We'll get our first look at Jacob deGrom, but for New York, they've seen Julio Tehran a lot, and the hitters, John, are probably not going to like what they see. No, they're not, and his record, of course, not indicative of how good he has pitched. He is in the top of a lot of pitching categories and I think tonight's game is going to be different than the previous two and what I mean by that is two pitchers who throw strikes are on the attack the hitters are going to have to take advantage of what little mistakes each pitcher makes and Julio Tehran has really progressed in his short beginning to his hopefully long career and his four keys to pitching success tonight we talked about Julio having some trouble with his first 30 pitches of a ball game he gets Touched up a little bit with that. We'll leave the first 30 in the bullpen tonight, Julian, and get started with pitch number 31 here in the first inning. And battery magic. How about he and Betancourt working together? These two young guys that have all for a long time been the top prospects of the Braves organization getting to work together in the big leagues. It's going to be fun to watch. So Tehran, another toss or two, and then he'll be ready to go with Young, Lagaris, and Daniel Murphy coming up. Mets are having a rough time of it. They've lost six of their last seven games. A series that began with some hope for New York of staying relevant in the race hasn't worked out that way for Terry Collins club. Their defense let him down in game one of the series. They committed three errors in the Atlanta eighth and blew a lead and fell five to three. Last night the Braves won five four and maybe the most impressive thing that we haven't talked much about was the great work by the Braves bullpen and picking up Mike Miner in game two. Well the bullpen is is the strength coming out of spring training everybody feared the bullpen they knew what they could do from the seventh inning on the starters were unbelievable in the beginning of the year offense struggled so now the offense is picking it up and I think the bullpen is going to start hitting its stride because the healthiness of their bullpen seems to be at the best it's been all year. So we at long last are ready to go. Eric Young Jr. is going to lead off for New York. Batting 236 with a homer and 11 driven in. If there's a third key chip, it would be try to keep this guy off the base. He's a good table setter. And a perfect pitch gets us underway. Dan Iasonia. And Atlanta resident has the plate tonight. There's Dan. No balls and a strike. Spoils that pitch and hits it into the club level foul. The last couple of nights we've been talking about each pitcher and why they're at the position on the mound where they are with their foot. Well, Julio Tehran has switched. He used to be a first base side of the rubber, and now the big adjustment that he has made, the faith in that adjustment has really it's played out in his year and his progress. Ground ball, first base side, easy play for Freeman and that third key comes into play. Young's retired on a ground ball out. One down. And what I mean by that is when you're on the first base side of the rubber, Julio Tehran had a bad habit of getting underneath the ball and kind of gliding to the plate. He had trouble with one part of the plate. Now what he's done is he's been able to keep his fastball down. He's got the angle from the third base side of the rubber with that real good slider. And he has just become the complete pitcher, the front end of the rotation, if you will. And he's a guy you don't mind matching up against anybody when there's a big game if they're at that position in the end of the year. When you say uh, gliding a little bit, are you saying he's doing a little better job of kind of collecting himself at the top of his leg? Kick? Yeah, he's staying on plane. He's allowing his arm and body to catch up. He's not trying to sink the ball with his body or his hand. He lets the life of his pitches speak for themselves, and he can get to both sides of the plate. When you're trying to figure out what kind of pitcher you want to be and you sink the ball and you have lateral movement then it makes more sense to be on the first base side of the rubber 
but he was getting underneath a lot of pitches and now he's got the angle to stay on top. And to me that's the biggest difference see that slider break even though that was thrown for a ball imagine on the other side where he's got to start that slider to get it to be effective. And now he's got the angle that he wants against right handers he'll be able to as he starts that more on the plate. He, that's why he has such a. Great average against. Lagares drives one toward left that'll be playable for Justin Upton. And that's the second out in the opening inning. But what he's really been able to do and I think the biggest benefit is against the left handers. The left handers are only hitting 230. I'm sorry 187 off of a right handed pitcher. Think about that. That's hard to do. And now he he owns that side of the plate that that he was having struggling to, to get to before. And the outside part of the plate if you can make one area of the plate really good let's say 80 percent of the time you can throw it where you want to on one side the other side you don't have to be as good. But if you're mediocre on both sides you better be able to move the ball in and out change speeds. So if you own one side of the plate the hitters have to adjust to you and you can be mediocre on the other side and be very successful. This will be a good challenge one of the game's best pitchers against one of the league's best hitters. Tehran versus Murphy for the first time tonight. And Murphy's had another good series against the Braves. Murphy hit a long two run homer here last night. One of two surrendered by Mike Miner. 104 hits for Murphy. That's the most in the National League, and it's tied for second most in the majors. You gotta think that Murphy's an all star candidate with all those hits, don't you? He would be if I had uh, a choice to make. I think the players had to have their ballots in to round out the roster by last Sunday. And of course, as we all know, the whole process ought to be reversed where the players are picking the starters and the fans are picking the backup players. Not the way it is, though. Hitters count three balls and a strike. And that caught a corner. Murphy wasn't too sure about it. Yeah, that was that was probably a ball, and that feels good for a pitcher on a 3-1 count. It's Paul off the plate. Let's see how he caught the ball. That the court did a nice job acting as if his glove was on the plate. That's Dan, out of play. Dan Isonia, I think, is uh, a guy who's fair and he will let you have your say. But then his fuse gets real short after that. Well, that last pitch made Murphy swing it. Sure did. A ball. Because <clears throat> he had to protect. Tehran strikes him out. Murphy's mad at the strikeout, but he's more mad at strike two, I think. No chance for anyone to stash their all star ballots as we head to the bottom of our scoreless first inning.
I don't think he took a ground ball during infield here while DeGrom is warmed up. Yeah, he got right in the sight of Dan Isonia, who throws his hands up like, what do you want? Or if he just wanted to know how upset he still was and still is. He better lighten up because I'm telling you, Isonia won't put up with it. Lighten up, Francis. As we head to the bottom of our first inning, Toyota presents the Braves starting nine. Andrelton Simmons has done good work against the Mets. And as we pointed out, the one, two, three men for the Braves lineup have done good work. And, John, they'll have to against this man from New York. Yeah, pretty athletic, lanky pitcher. Deep short and through for Upton on the game's first pitch. One pitch, one hit for Atlanta against right-hander Jacob DeGrom. Well, for Jacob DeGrom, he's come onto the scene and had a pretty nice stint in Vegas. You see his four home starts. He didn't give him any runs. And on the road, the ERA is a little bit higher. But overall, he has been pretty good. First pitch, as you just saw, they're hitting 333 off of him. So first pitch swinging, base hit for B.J. Upton. And the work scouting report on him. The funny part is the top of the order is what we've been bragging on the Braves for. First two guys in the order are typically guys he handles real nicely. So already the Braves have won the first part of that battle. And night moves. Yeah, I'm glad the cameras were on you, Chip, when you were doing that dance for Bob Seeger. But he is 0-4 in night games. So when the sun goes down, he's in big trouble tonight. Maybe in big trouble here in the first with B.J. Upton extending his hitting streak to nine games. And got a good lead at first. So John, you like this guy? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, everyone we talked about in the open, and, you know, everyone knows about Harvey. They know about Wheeler, and they're talking about Syndergaard. And I think the future is bright for the Mets when you find a guy that maybe not everybody was talking about. He's made some strides, and uh, I like his makeup and the way that he delivers the baseball. It's only going to get better, I think. Very athletic, you know, maybe a cross between Arroyo and uh, Buckholtz. Uh, probably a little stronger than Buckholtz. Lanky like Arroyo and doesn't have the same delivery, but he's got a firm fastball and he mixes speeds very well. How about a tall version of Lincecum with the with the dew. The dew, yeah. Throw three of them in there. Better be careful when he's at the plate too. He handles the, the bat very well. Have an amazing stat on DeGrom and the Mets pitchers at the plate when he comes up later on tonight. You won't believe it. Two balls and a strike. And bell tie down the middle. Ampleton took it. So you like Ampleton hitting second, fellas? I do. I do too. As long as he is willing to use the whole field. I think he's been up in the big leagues long enough to have uh, learned a few things about the way pitchers try to pitch him, about the way teams try to pitch him. And he certainly played the game long enough to have a guy on in front of him that can run to be able to take some pitches. He doesn't strike out hardly at all. Big hole right side for him here with a 2 2 pitch. And DeGrom knows he's going to try to hit it to the right side. So, John, what does he do? He crowds him with the next pitch. But now it's full. Yeah, it's full. And you're, as a pitcher, you're thinking, okay, you know the runner's going to be going. Do I have an aggressive pitcher that I can throw something out of the strike zone and maybe get him to swing and miss? Upton's running. As you'd expect, Simmons fought it off and is still alive. Because these are opportunities to take advantage of. A couple things happening. The hitter knows the runner's going. Anything close, he's more apt to want to swing at it if he doesn't have a, a recognition of the strike zone. He's a tough guy to strike out, I get it. But sometimes being in this role in the second spot, which is not what he's been accustomed to, you can get a little aggressive and expand the strike zone. Simmons with just 30 strikeouts in 295 at bats. Again, BJ's running, and again, Hamilton stays alive. Key here for a young pitcher is does he have enough faith in a secondary pitch to throw now after 
about six fastballs in a row. And you're running BJ in the last two pitches, so you think that his jump will be a little less on the third time. I don't think he got a good jump the first first foul ball. Second one was okay. Again he runs. And again, Simmons fouls it off. The other thing about batting second is in a situation like this, if you can go to the right side, fine. But on a 3 2 count, the guy's running, you're up there for your, you've got to hit the way you know how to hit now. And don't change anything. If the guy gives you a pitch, like I said, to go to right field, fine. But otherwise, if he tries to come in with a fastball, if you're Andrelson, you got him in a situation right here where you can ambush one. DeGrom did go with an off speed. I think he wanted a change up there. And he missed outside. A nine pitch at bat for Simmons. And this sets up very nicely for the Braves. A leadoff hit followed by a walk. And now DeGrom finds himself in the heart of the Braves' order. Top of the order. First two guys are getting on already tonight. Good sign. Freeman's knocked in three runs in the series. He has only one hit. That hit a run scoring double in the third inning last night. Do not want this first pitch to be a fastball. You're in trouble if you do. And he threw a nice tight slider. I mean, the book is so well written now on. Freddie Freeman it comes down to execution on a pitcher on first pitches especially with runners in scoring position. He's going to swing a good portion of that time on the first pitch. Tried the same spot but missed. One ball one strike. So hard to pitch in uh, to a guy like Freddie for fear of making a mistake in there. So that's why you see so many misses causing him to kind of jackknife out of the way. The teams just don't want to get the ball out over the middle of the plate to him because of his great power the other way. Just missed a corner outside. Now Freeman. Can have a whole lot of fun. Three balls and a strike. Murphy's not too happy. No, with just match. watching. He took his glove off. He got his hands on his hips. Felt like that was the same pitch called a strike on him. Freeman walks. A single and back to back bases on balls have three Braves aboard with nobody out. He walked three in his last start against the Pirates, and it was a good outing. Daniel Murphy, I mean, if you had odds on him making it through nine innings tonight, I don't think they're very good. No. And you know, in fairness to him, if it was a 2 1 pitch that caused it to be 2 2, it was, it, it was a pitch difference. It was a walk. Yes. You know, so he, in his mind, he had already got ready to go to first. So Justin Upton has a runner at every base and nobody out. Inside corner strike. Is a great pitch with the bases loaded. If you're going to go with a fastball, that's the last thing I think Justin Upton would be thinking about is a ball in on the guy that just walked a couple hitters. Balls, two strikes. But the thing that I, I like about certain pitchers, you see how free and easy it is for him to throw a baseball. It doesn't look like effort. The ball gets on and stays on plane. That's why I think guys like him, if they continue to upgrade their second and third pitches, they've got a nice future. Because they can, for the most part, he has located his fastball. He's missed by an inch or two. Now the slider into Freddie was chasing him, as you said, Joe.
He was a third baseman and shortstop in college right. at Stetson. Converted to pitching in his junior year. So he hasn't been pitching all that long. Right. A ninth round pick in 2010. Good stop, Darno. Two and two. Look how shallow Juan Lagares plays in center field for the Mets. With one of the biggest power hitters the Braves have at the plate and the base is loaded. That may be the that may be the shallowest I've seen anybody play this year. That's where you see a lot of guys play for pitchers. He struck him out. That pitch perfectly located. A 94 mile an hour fastball is the first out of the inning. See that part of the plate is very easy for him. Very natural to get there. First base side of the rubber. Arm side command of the plate is, is pretty good for him. You can see though he has not shown any hitter that he could throw his slider anywhere close though. To be fearful of it so. The change up and fastball in the first inning been okay. Very good. The slider not so good early on. Jason Hayward fouls the first pitch off and is down a quick strike. And it's more like a hard cutter. I mean, that one right there is a good example of trying to bury it in on the left hander. At 90 miles an hour, and it's. It doesn't have to move very much right. at that velocity. E.J. Upton singled on the first pitch in the bottom of the inning. Simmons and Freeman have walked. Justin Upton just struck out. One, two, three hitters still aboard for the Braves in a scoreless first. 23rd pitch for DeGrom on a muggy night. And he missed with it. It's two and two. Big pitch coming up for him here already. First inning. Not wanting to go three and two and be forced to throw a strike. That's exactly right. And you got to go to where you're most comfortable. And so far, where he's been most comfortable is a way to a lefty into a righty. Yeah, when he walked Freeman, he was just missing that outside corner. Braves are doing an excellent job of making this kid work. First time they've seen Jacob DeGrom in regular season play. Hayward's the fifth man to hit in the inning. Even though you're fresh coming out of the gate in the first inning, there's a lot of stress pitches he's had to make early on. Pop fly toward right. Granderson broke back. Now comes charging in. He's under it. There's the catch. BJ will not advance. And it's a good thing. That's why, by the way, I maintain that a pitch count is an arbitrary number that means absolutely nothing. Because if he gets out of this inning, okay, with one run or no runs or whatever it is, his 28 to 30 pitches are going to be more stressful than just 30 pitches through two innings. So you can't look at them the same way. And you look at his count, almost even balls and strikes. You say, wow, he's he's struggled with his command, and to a certain degree he did, but he threw strike one to four of the first five guys. He just couldn't finish anybody off. Yeah, it's that really, it's that secondary pitcher, well, I would call it his third pitch that he struggled with, that cutter slash slider. He's only thrown a couple that they fouled off. Everything else has been off the plate. 
Chris Johnson bats with the bases loaded now two outs. You want a barometer for the Braves ball club look at what Atlanta has done with Chris Johnson being productive. That, Georgia lottery hitting the jackpot. Sorry Chip that those numbers look familiar. From last season right. for almost a whole season's worth of work. You might recall out of the gate Chris Johnson was this team's cleanup hitter mm -hmm. and one big reason why was his ability to make consistent contact. Chris isn't going to hit 20 30 home runs but he's going to put the ball in play. And I'll tell you what I've been impressed with him is the book on him early was swing and miss a lot but has a lot of power. And I think it's been the opposite where the power numbers down but his average last year was almost batting ground worthy. Tell you what I've been impressed with DeGrom already here and his pitches he's made in on Justin yeah. and Chris in a real tough spot. And he's that's where his, him up. that's where his freedom is. You can tell each pitcher has a freedom area. Some will pitch away real well. He throws really well to his arm side. So he's got Chris behind in the count a ball and two strikes. Just missed. Did he change his uh, delivery there a little bit? He didn't quick pitch him, but he didn't have quite as high a leg kick. No, I think it was it was close to the same. Is and, it? And that ball was was definitely off the plate. PNC pitch tracks. Well, here's where he wants action. Two and two. I don't think you can get Chris out there that middle of the plate away trying to go away from him. I think that you're playing right into Chris's hands is. His best stuff this inning has obviously been in to righties. Especially since he can't locate that slider yet. Another 2 2 pitch. Here's vintage Chris Johnson. That is not an encouraging number for the Mets. 32 pitches by DeGrom here in the opening inning. But somehow so far he has avoided some kind of number because 32 pitches usually results in some action on the right. scoreboard. Hot shot. Campbell can't get it. It's into the left field corner. Two are going to score. Here comes Freddie around third. They're going to wave him. Here comes the relay throw. It's going to be late. The Braves break through with a bases clearing double by Chris Johnson. It took the 33rd pitch for it to happen John but a hot shot and once again not putting any onus on the third baseman but again not able to make a play not able to get in front of the ball to at least knock it down eat him up. So the Braves get a single two walks and a double with two outs and lead three nothing over the Mets here in the first. Long meeting with Dan Worthen, the New York pitching coach. It's amazing how much the confidence and momentum of a game can sway on that one pitch in the very first inning. If he gets Chris Johnson, strikes him out, I mean, that Mets dugout is pumped up. They weathered a big storm. Pitcher has his confidence up. And the Braves know that they missed on an opportunity. But the other is true now. And DeGrom has to add to a very heavy opening inning workload now. Tommy Lestella bats and takes inside. Ball one. I think just about every strike call has been on the other side of the plate. That hasn't been swung at, that's been in. Hey. 
And there's the first. Myron. I think you're right. Fly ball toward left. EY gives chase, won't have a play. It's one and two. This isn't a sexy offensive ball club right now for the Braves, but it sure is fun to watch the creativity with which they're putting runs across. They've been manufacturing runs by the bunches over this six game winning streak. It's all in the eye of the beholder now. <laughs> no, that's true. One two pitch is cut on and missed. 37 pitches for DeGrom. The pride of Stetson University is a mad hatter. He gave up three in the first inning. Chris Johnson's bases clearing double. The big blow in the inning. After one, Julio Tehran and the Braves enjoy a three nothing lead. For the first and talking to Freddie Gonzalez earlier today he was saying he feels his team is playing their best baseball of the season over the last couple of weeks he said he's really thinks that the team is given a good feeling of how good it can be and one thing specifically he mentioned guys he talked about all the phases being good starting pitching the bullpen the situational hitting he said you know if you go back and look at what we've done when we've had a runner on third we've almost always brought him in during the stretch and Chris Johnson making that the case already tonight. That's a good point Jen and, and we've talked for really for two seasons about the offense and needing to do little things to help overcome gaps in the offense where they're not hitting home runs or they've certainly been doing those little things well lately. So Tehran with a three run cushion after an inning. will face Curtis Granderson cleaning up for New York tonight and he gets an outside corner call to strike. I'm telling you I'm convinced having seen it enough it is so contagious. Hitting is contagious, picking people up is contagious, and when everything goes well, you don't have to worry about being the guy. You, the next guy will get it. And right now, they're doing the little things you have to do. Big two out hits. We didn't see that early in the year. That missed low. Two Granderson who's had a big series. Four hits, including a couple of homers for the Mets. Second time this season he's had games with homers in back to back appearances. Now he's got a 2 2 count. He's been a money hitter for the Mets since May. He got off to a terrible start. They were booing him like crazy. At City Field in the early weeks of the season. Anderson hitting 278 since May 1st. And that's a pop up. Shallow left. Upton comes in. Justin's under it. 
And Granderson's retired. Four up, four down for Tehran to start his night. And here's Campbell. Eric Campbell filling in for David Wright. David Wright out with a sore shoulder. The Mets are hoping he'll be able to come back and play for them Friday when they get back home to start their homestand with the Texas Rangers. Well, they missed David Wright's bat. But regardless of whether or not he was able to swing the series, I think they missed his glove at third base more. Absolutely. Yes, he did. Thank you, CB. CB and I have always been copacetic. CB Buckner, the umpire at first. That's too high. One ball, one strike. Tehran has had a terrific June. Two wins, two losses. That's not the terrific part. His command is what was terrific. Only three walks the entire month. Three walks all month. Yep. That's that's Maddox like. 37 strikeouts in 35 and a third innings. And we've talked about it on Braves Live. We'll talk about it, I'm sure, a time or two tonight. John, Joe, where is Julio Tehran among the elite pitchers in the National League and how worthy of all star consideration do you think he will be by Mike Matheny and his staff. He's an all star period. He's had an all star year and he'll be rewarded for it. John sees more of the. Of the pitchers in the league on, in the other divisions and right. then we really get an opportunity to. But I can't imagine that there's. Too many other guys more worthy. I mean Cueto's. Going to get it. Wainwright's going to get it. Of course, Kershaw, Granke, and then depending on some of the teams that may not have a representative worthy, a pitcher or two. But line to right. Jason Hayward in the sunshine has that. Campbell's retired. Two outs. I'm just telling you, based on his progression, you would not be much of an underdog no matter whose ace you went up against if it was a one game playoff or to start a series with Julio Tehran on the mound. That's how far he has advanced in the eyes of hitters in the eyes of that last name on his back. I mean certainly Kershaw is always going to get the attention. He's going to be the one that it's going to be hard to beat then probably Wainwright. That's high praise. I, I, I just have seen enough of him lately and really over the last three quarters of a season. He's got it. Lucas Duda pops one up left side, and Chris Johnson's got that. Six up, six down for Tehran. He's thrown 27 pitches on a hot night, and he leads 3 0.
field for his last All Star game and what should be an emotional and unforgettable night. Special coverage starts at 4:30 on Fox Sports One, followed by the 2014 All Star game at 7:30 on Big Fox. You have until 11:59 p.m. July 3rd to cast your votes for the National League All Star game. Here are the voting tabulations up to the minute for the senior circuit. I pretty much said all along that I there weren't too many arguments there. Mm -hmm. Did you guys happen to see the uh, tongue in cheek kind of just a second. Bethan court to short. Hada loads up and gets Christian for round number one. The little uh, I, I approve this commercial type thing for the Brewers and their promotion. Of oh, oh, the, the one where they Cardinals fans thought they were dissing. Yeah, them. yeah. I thought it was pretty funny for Lacroix. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, it's a basically it's a spoof off of a political ad. Type. I I approve this message mm -hmm. and. I thought it was good and yeah, the Cardinal Nation was a little up in arms over it, but it was all good fun trying to get Jonathan LaCroix is Jonathan yeah. LaCroix uh, some more votes to try and that's a great great idea. Joe and I were talking about LaCroix in the first series of the season. He might be the best catcher in baseball that not many folks outside the upper Midwest know an awful lot about. Yeah, he's having an unbelievable year. That's a position loaded all of a sudden. Remember how lean it used to be over the sure. last couple of years? And now you've got guys from Montero, Posey, Gaddis went before he got hurt, Lucroy, and of course Molina. And somebody's not going to make it at that position and, and be deserving of it. How about Tehran with a base hit? Well, there's pressure on him tonight. This guy DeGrom can swing the bat and he didn't want to be embarrassed or didn't want to get shown up. Watch him throw some top hand on this. Slashing. Oh, oh. Been there, done that? Yeah. <laughs> hand in the air and nothing to it. So a one out single for Tehran brings up BJ. He singled. Between short and third on the first pitch of the night for the Braves batsman. And he shows butt. DeGrom fields and fires to first in time. Tehran at second. Two outs. I think BJ's getting a break there on the at bat, getting that call to sacrifice. He was definitely. Bunning for a base hit and would have had one if he could have just gotten it closer to the third base line. Yeah, Freddie, I think he's asking him. That was for a hit, right? Just couldn't place it where he wanted. But it's an RBI chance for Simmons. The Braves got a run scoring hit from Chris Johnson with two outs in the first. Let's see if Andleton can make it a 4 nothing Braves lead. Maury Wills taught just about all of us that came up through the Dodge organization how to bunt. And one of the things he talked about for those of us that tried to bunt for hits was that if you bunt it to third and you're bunting for a hit, make it a base hit or make it foul. If, it, if it's too close to the line and rolls foul, then no harm done. Lead for Julio at second, two outs. He tried the right side, but Murphy's got it. And from the outfield grass, he'll make the peg. No runs ahead. A man left with through two in Atlanta. Three nothing. Braves lead the Mets.
sweep them out of town. Atlanta got three runs in the first inning to support Julio Terran, the Braves right hander, is trying to earn his eighth victory of the season. And Terran is the subject of tonight's AT&T Universe trivia question. He has a 234 ERA and 103 strikeouts. Name the last Braves pitcher with 200 or more strikeouts and an earned run average under 275. Your Cy Young year, what was your ERA? Not under that. The old 10 runs in late August, Colorado took care of that. Ah. I'm, I'm going to quickly guess because that's the only way my computer works. It's to quickly guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to say Tim Hudson. Be a good guess. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> those are I all. Those go. are all star <laughs> rankings right there. Right. All star caliber rankings. Well, a casual fan will look up and say, "Well, hey, he only has seven wins. That doesn't really tell the story for Julio this year." Right. That did say last pitcher though. Yes. Right? Yes, and and I wanted to say Steve Avery, but it may be someone. Well, I think Maddox then. has done it a few times. Maddox definitely had over 200 strikeouts. ERA under two seven. That's right. One couple of years he was under two. Yeah, it's real hard to pitch when every hitter's 0 and 2. <laughs> oh. <laughs> guy, guy ought to go in the hall of yeah, fame. Yeah, right. That's what yeah. he pitched. Gee. My gosh, just like telling Tiger Woods, it's real hard to play golf when you know what yardage every <laughs> club is. Travis Darno leads off for New York in the third. He's one for seven in the series. Darno's been a highly touted prospect for a while. He did not grow up a Met. He was originally a Philly. Well, they've traded away a lot of good young players over the last several seasons in Philadelphia. Darno, one of them, needed to acquire Roy Halladay. Pop up in foul ground right side should be handled by Freddie Freeman. It is. And there's the first out in the New York third. Here's Tejada. Well, Terry Collins led team. They're going to fight. Absolutely. He may be undermanned, and he may not have the mixture he wants. You know, whether it's coming out of the pen. I believe his starting staff has hung in there and done a nice job for him. But they're going to fight, and he won't tolerate many games like they played in the first game of this series. Tejada with a 242 average, a couple of homers, 17 knocked in. Well, we've already seen what he's done in this series. Granderson's had a great first two games. He's moved him immediately to the cleanup spot. Ligaris had a good night last night. He moved up to the top of the order. He's trying to, he's not afraid to shuffle his lineup just based on who's hot and who's not right now. And you got to give him credit for trying there. Well, he would have had DeGrom higher, but I think that really does not give your confidence to your position players. <laughs> yeah. I just thought the only thing that was unfair, and it leaked, like everything seems to leak, the conversation of what the GM thought the Mets were capable of doing this year, coming out of spring training, winning 90 and 92 games. It's just unrealistic. That's not the type of team they had. It's not the type of, type of wins they would have gotten. Tejada. Skies one shallow center out goes Simmons. He's got it. And it's eight up, eight down for Julio. And DeGrom, the pitcher, will try to hit. So if you hear that, what does that say about your manager? Your manager can't feel good about that in the sense that you don't have that kind of team. Right. You're in a you're in a stopgap. You're waiting for Harvey to get healthy. You're waiting for the maturity of their pitching staff to get there. And you're certainly not putting together a team thinking that guys like Abreu and Cologne. These guys aren't going to be the future of your organization. They're just trying to help your roster and win games now. So it was a little, a little odd to hear that, that they thought that highly of their team coming out of spring training, that they could amass that that kind of wins. And 90 or 92 wins might win the division on any given year. Sure. And in this right now, the state of the National League East, I just don't see that happening for the Mets with the Braves and Nats to contend with. 
Slow roller to first. Easy play for Freddie Freeman. And Tehran with seven pitches got three more outs. He's perfect through three innings. He leads 3 nothing. And here's who's due up next. Sponsored by Delta. Nothing bottom of the third inning on a steam bath night at Turner Field. Catch the Braves as they battle the Diamondbacks here at the ballpark this weekend. Act today and save up to 31% on all you can eat seats with the Braves' steal of the week. That's a $26 savings with an offer that's good tonight only. Take advantage of this great deal now at Braves.com slash steal. A lot of choices. We've seen the Cracker Jacks. We've seen the cotton candy. I love cotton candy. Do you? Yeah. Really? You guys wouldn't want me to have cotton candy up here, though. Why not? No, no, no. It would be bad. It would be first three innings. You wouldn't notice much, but then after I finish it, it would be it would be bad. Especially in your current situation right Bound, now. Be bouncing off the walls. Oh yeah. I kind of like to. I kind of like to experience that. To be honest. Well, with maybe you. Friday, fourth. You know, for the Fourth of July, we can test it out. I haven't seen any cotton candy up here at all all week, and I thought it was pretty much <laughs> that way all the time. <laughs> I'm just happy to see you guys. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> Two balls, no strikes for Freddie Freeman, who walked and scored. And that got a corner. We'll keep you up to date on the Nationals game. They're hosting Colorado tonight. Braves a half game ahead of them. Phillies are in Miami. It's scoreless in the bottom of the third. First final in the National League. Cleveland beat the Dodgers 5 4. Second final, San Diego 3, Cincinnati nothing. Wait, Cleveland went out and handled the Dodgers. San Diego is amazing. I, I just. I don't know what else Bud Black can do. I mean they can't score. But they've been pitching really well. And doing it. Recently without Andrew Cash. Yeah. too. On their fourth straight today. While the Padres are. Now nine and a half games out of first place. They're in third out west. They won a game the other day and got one hit. Right? <laughs> yeah, they've done it twice this year, believe it or not. Something that hasn't happened to one club since the 60s when the Dodgers did it. As Freddie Freeman chased a ball a little low and is struck out for out number one. Is this that cutter, John? Uh, this right here is going to be his changeup. 
He throws it kind of firm. But he takes enough off of it to have it kind of a dead fish. Take them off their fastball. That was a great location for it. 89 mile an hour changeup. Was it 89? Yeah, I might be wrong. And his cutter. I, I, once I saw the replay, I would agree with you. I thought it was change. Made a good pitch to retire Justin back in the Braves first. Justin had a big cut. I always admired those guys, the pitchers who had their normal fastball, but then had the so called BP fastball, batting practice fastball. There really wasn't a change up, and it wasn't their best fastball, but it was something that had a little bit off of it, may have a little bit of movement to it, and was kind of baffling to hitters sometimes because they were a little in between. You know, that, that 3 0 oh, get over fastball that they could use in any count. Takes a lot of trust. We've talked a lot, Joe, about Roy Halliday's playoff performance against the Reds when Johnny Gomes said he had eight pitches that day. What a weapon that is. Change speeds with everything and go get them. And both sides of the plate. Foul. One ball, two strikes. I mean, that, that's one of those guys that I've been talking about during this series that you enjoy watching play, and it's easy to say that sitting up here, but as John said, when you're sitting in the Braves dugout, you don't want a guy to pitch well against you. But I enjoy watching that those types of pitchers work, and I miss seeing Roy Halliday out there. How about that pitching? To Justin Upton, he struck him out twice. That was a 94 mile an hour fastball, and two quick outs in the third. I can see what you've been talking about, John. And there's a lot to like about him. Yeah, it's it's free and easy, and, and when he locates, it's it's going to be something special for the Mets. So I just don't remember them talking highly of of this kind of prospect when they were praising the Wheelers and Harveys and Sinners. That might have been a big advantage for him. He could fly under radar. And just continue to progress. He pitched at three levels last year and went seven and seven. A, double A, and triple A for New York. He's kind of got a long arm delivery that I don't know how tough that might be to pick up. It would seem to me a little easier to pick up because it is. A very long arm arm slot, I'll say. Throwing it straight behind him. Throwing his arm straight behind him. But much like what's underneath his hat, a lot of hair on his fastball, as they say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A tamper over the mound. Tejada gloves. Throws on the run. Safe at first. Hayward's speed earns him an infield hit and a marvelous effort by Tejada, who did all he could to prevent that second, or I should say that out with or that hit with two outs here in the third inning. You could just see a look on DeGrom's face too, and that ball went over his head like. Oh no. Good hustle by Jason as always. A three run double for Chris Johnson in the first. And that's where we stand now. Three runs on four Braves hits.
the starting pitcher. I used to love when somebody's landing spot was nowhere near mine. And these two guys pitch on opposite sides of the rubber, so you don't really have to mess with that. You take for granted the early part of the game, it's no big deal. The mound's fresh, but man, after a while, the toe drag and the landing spot. It just messes with your eyes when you get ready to go drop that leg down to a spot that's not your hole. Got a good shot of it right there. And then to make matters worse, when you come out of the pen in the ninth inning, it really can be an issue. Now you always have the opportunity to have the ground crew come out and fix something that might be deeper than you want. The old big toe on most pitchers pay the price on the right foot. Johnson skies one foul again, two balls, two strikes. Over short. Chris Johnson's two for two. There was the off speed pitch. That was the first time he really gave it away. And he really telegraphed it. See the grip. He slowed everything down to try and change speeds other than what his hand was going to do to the baseball. And it just sat there right in the middle. Good balance by Johnson. I stand back and Taking advantage of it. So two on for Tommy Listella. He struck out to end the Braves first. The Braves are working over Jacob DeGrom. That was his 69th pitch. Came right back with it though. To the warning track, we'll have room. And that retires the side. Braves get two hits with two outs in the third and maintain a three run lead. He looks at the Mets. He's got young Lagaris, and then we'll keep our eyes on Danny Murphy, who was not happy about striking out at the end of that opening inning for the New York offense. 
Nine up, nine down for Julio. He's been staked to a nice first inning advantage. Around tonight looking for his second career victory against the Mets. The Braves usually don't score for him. He's gotten less than two runs of support per outing in his three previous starts against the New York club. But he loves pitching in the East. He loves pitching here at home. So those things in play in game three tonight. He's Eric Young Jr. He bounced out to first in the first. And he's got through the first 30 pitches with relative ease. Five of the last six outs have been fly ball pop up outs. Young with a little blooper into center field has the first Mets hit of the game. Talked a lot about the Braves struggles to find a leadoff hitter. Same thing could be said for the Mets. Eric Young tonight is batting leadoff for the 41st time. It's far and away the most leadoff assignments on the club. But they've used eight different number one hitters this season. Eight. Juan Ligaris the second most leadoff assignments. He's done it 20 times. Tonight he's hitting second and Young's running. The pitch a strike. The throw from the knees of Bethencourt sailed high. And Young with a terrific jump steals his 22nd base of the year. He got a huge jump. He stole that on Julio. Even the great arm can't catch this up. About 11 feet of strides before he even deliver the ball. A little uh, for those of my era, Benito Santiago looking through from the knees. Lagares tries to bunt. Tehran got it and had no chance to throw to second. Chris Johnson ducked just in case Julio was going to let her rip out to second base. I mean, I understand what they're trying to do here, and he gets it down. You got runners on first and third in a rally, but. Well, remember the other night, the Mets got single runs in the first three innings, and the Braves, thanks to some help from the Mets, came back. To win that game, and maybe they were kind of thinking the same thing. Get a run in here, and cut into the lead a little bit, get your offense going, because nobody had reached base until this inning. No ill will by Murphy with Dan Iasonia as he stood in for his second at bat of the night. A ball, no strikes. Here's why there was some of that frustration from Murphy. His pitch that was called strike two in the first inning. And one on Freeman that was called a ball that upset him. So it's around to the stretch, John, for the first time in this ball game. Is that as big a deal as we sometimes make it out to be? No, not really. I, I, I think uh, you know it's more indicative of how good Murphy has been for the Mets, trying to pitch carefully. And they do pitch carefully. Murphy walks first and second, one out, and here's Granderson. I'm still impressed that you Darvish pitches the whole game out of the stretch. That to me is whenever you could pitch out of the windup, it was such a luxury because you had deception and your natural movement 
going to home plate. You're going to. That usually is why the windup is there for you. But he, for whatever reason, mechanically, has pitched entirely out of the stretch as a starter. Which you rarely see. Thirty three year old Curtis Granderson, the pride of Chicago. During his ninth full major league season, signed by the Mets to a long term contract. They signed him, fellas, for 2017. And coming off the season last year where he managed to play only 61 games. A broken right wrist in spring training, a broken finger on his left hand in May. It's no secret that the Mets the last couple of years have been desperately looking for any kind of production from their outfielders that they can find. And he has come on after a very very bad April. One ball two strikes. Well, they, they put a lot of money and a lot of stock into Jason Bay not too many years ago. That certainly did not pan out. They had Angel Pagan in center field, made an ill advised trade of him to the Giants. And he's really prospered there. That one couldn't be corralled by Bethancourt, and a wild pitch chases runners to second and third with one out. A little unfortunate hit the shin guard at an awkward place and just scooted it dead right. Spiked his slider. See the spin catch the bottom of that shin guard that protects his foot. So a chance for Granderson to chase home a couple of runs perhaps with a hit here. You know single a bunt try. Pop up and now a walk and wild pitch. And now a fly ball toward left. Justin settles behind. He's got it. There's the catch, and he'll concede the run. A sacrifice fly by Granderson earns him his 39th RBI, and the Mets are on the board. It's now a 3 1 game. And Campbell hits representing the tying run. It's an explosive slider, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, knowing that a hitter wants to be aggressive off your fastball, so you throw him a first pitch slider, and there's no better feeling when he swings out of out of the strike zone. Just to hate it when they were taken. And just like that, Campbell's behind 0-2. That was kind of pitch it appeared like DeGrom was making on the right handed hitters in the first inning. Campbell got tied up. To the right again, 0 and 2.
You know how many foul balls right go into a stands and people do some crazy stuff to get the ball and all that we take for granted. In Australia. That was the biggest cheered. Thing that went on. They don't. They're used to cricket. They don't get any action in the crowds. That ball bounced off Tehran's leg and that looked like it stung him. Eric Campbell has an infield hit. Yeah, anytime uh, a pitcher doesn't react to go get the baseball, you know that it really hurt. Safe to run, I know that. It was going to get back through the middle, it looked like. And drive in a run. On the outside of his right leg, is that yeah. where it got him? Mm -hmm. Coming in the meat of the calf there, or the side of the calf. One thing you want to make sure as a pitcher, even though you want to stay in the game with the lead, and that's always the first response is just let me throw some pitches. Is that whatever part of your leg or, or, or part that gets hit, you don't want to favor it so that it ends up translating upwards into your right arm. So as the game will go on, I'm sure it'll tighten up, but all you want to do is make sure you can land on that leg without any re apprehension whatsoever. And get some attention on it in the dugout too, so that it doesn't, if it did get his cap muscle, doesn't tighten up on him before the fifth. So he's due to hit in the bottom half of the inning. So an infield hit for Campbell. Murphy's at third. And Lucas Duda's the hitter. There are two out here in the fourth. The Mets have scored their first run of the game. This year, the Mets started with a tandem at first base. They had Ike Davis, they had Lucas Duda. They had those two guys sharing the first base position for the first four or six weeks of the year until finally the Mets decided to cast their lot with Duda. They traded Ike Davis to the Pirates. Great point last night. You compare the numbers of Lucas Duda on the line to those of Freddie Freeman. Freeman has a much higher batting average. Freddie 13 homers. Duda has 12. Freeman 44 RBIs. Duda has 41. They had him hitting higher in the order too earlier in the season. And he's kind of found a comfort zone down there in the sixth spot. Lucas out of Riverside, California, and USC. That's got him in the seventh round back in 2007. Sky foul, still a ball and two strikes. They used to have a great college tournament in Riverside. University of California at Riverside or Cal State Riverside, however they say it. But they would have a big eight team tournament, kind of a round robin thing. It was you almost had to wait in line to get an invitation to go. It was that popular. Jammed him and it's popped up to right. Jason Hayward puts the squeeze on that. The Mets strike for their first run on a couple of hits and a walk. Julio Tehran is due second in the fourth with a two run lead.
Always fun to have John in the booth with us here at Turner Field and the Smoltz Follies are our SunTrust shining moments. Oh, we got other ones. Oh, yeah. All right, that's two. I, I want to see one more, though. Can I see one more? No, I want to see one more. That one's beautiful, though. <laughs> this is the one I wanted to see. That was a little mock. <laughs> you know, this is what Perez used to do every time he was on the mound, do a little dance, right? Yeah. Well, when, <laughs> when you, if you would have seen the Expos dugout, they all fell off of the bench <laughs> laughing. And I had told the guys, I told Glavin and Maddox, I said, watch, when I, if I get a chance to face this guy, watch what happens if I strike him out. And they didn't know what I was going to do. Well, it made at that time CNN play of the day. Well, he had told Eddie Perez, because we had had to face each other back to back. He said, you tell Smoltz, next time I face him and I strike him out, I'm going to sit on the mound. So Eddie passed on the information. I don't know how many pitches it was. I think it was 10, but I was an emergency hack. I was not allowing him to strike me out. I didn't want to see him sit on the mound. So he never got to. He never got a chance to sit on the mound. But I had wanted to do a little mock kind of whatever dance. So now of those four highlights that we showed, was that your favorite? The the, the mocking of Perez or who was that that caused your body to go into just <laughs> a Jeremy. spasm? The umpire? No, and no. Oh, got hit, and they just Mark Thompson. A, you had a stroke. Oh yeah, he hit me right in the kidney. Oh, they were all laughing. Was Perez laughing? I don't. Yeah, yeah he's <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I tried to always have fun in certain moments that uh, you know without totally embarrassing somebody. But yeah, there was a guy right there in that shot though. That, it's a heck of a player, Jose Pedro. He had my number for sure. Tough out. Julio singled his first time up. Bats here with one out. Bethancourt struck out. I kind of like the stop, drop, and roll myself. That's probably number that's one. There's no doubt. Um, caused me some issues afterwards, unfortunately. I think I had a rib or two out of place when <laughs> after I was done with that. And then besides the fireman video, Mark Grant had accused me of. I don't think Julio had any idea where that ball was hit. I think he got jammed so bad he went down the line shaking his right hand like that. He got jammed unmercifully. Dinged up here. Two quick outs. Let's see if BJ can work the count a bit and give Tehran a little rest. 3 1 Braves, fourth inning, trying to sweep away New York. Mark Grant had something on you? Well, he accused me of being the mascot of the Padres uh. <laughs> when my hat came off. <laughs> <laughs> Fryer. Right. So I think somebody had blown that up too, or something. I mean, ruthless in this game, you know. Yeah, heaven forbid you <laughs> stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> I mean, Father Smoltz does kind of yeah. a nice ring to yeah. it, doesn't it, Joe? <laughs> Papa John, especially when I was on, <laughs> especially when I was on all fours trying to catch my breath. Oh boy! San Diego was the place where I got my first kind of rookie, not hazing, but I'd won that game against the Mets, and the next trip was to San Diego, and so I was. You know, eager anybody's request, and and I had got a note on my my locker and my chair said, uh, Mr. Bear would like to do an interview with you, and they gave me the number, and they had that back in the day when the clubhouse had a phone right there in the clubhouse, so I just 
Jolly right over to the phone and noticed more guys than usual were paying attention. And I dialed up the number and it said, Welcome to the San Diego Zoo. <laughs> and I quickly put the phone down and realized, okay, I'm now in the big leagues. Watch out. Mr. Bear. As Upton is down swinging. DeGrom gave up three early, hasn't given up much since. He has struck out six Braves through four, and he's due up when we come back. One Braves lead the Mets in game three of our series as we've mentioned before times running out to vote for your 2014 MLB All-Stars help Freddie Freeman Evan Gaddis Hamilton Simmons and Justin Upton get to the Midsummer Classic you can vote up to 35 times for your favorite Braves players and you get a special offer of ten dollars off club reserve tickets when the Braves battle the Marlins July 21st through the 24th visit Braves.com slash vote today voting ends tomorrow at midnight. I noticed uh, two positions, one each in each league. That little lean, I think, shortstop in the National League, outside of two whiskey, and then kind of second base, I think. So shortstop in the American League, Jeter, and, and then he scratched to try and find uh, some other worthy candidates. Well. I thought that when I saw Utley's name up there, I said I didn't have any arguments. And I, I never have an argument with Chase Utley when he's healthy and playing full time. Darno flies one toward left. Easy play, one out. But uh, that, that kind of surprised me that he's didn't surprise me that he's leading. But uh, I started trying to think of another candidate for the National League second base, and outside of Murphy, because he's here tonight, I couldn't come up with anybody. Yeah, the usual suspects are have been for the most part been Rollins at short, and the Reds, Phillips, Phillips. But first base is always pretty loaded as well. Mm -hmm. Ruben Tejada is the Mets shortstop. He takes high ball one. I wonder what they're doing the American League with all those first basemen. I mean, there's a bu bunch of them. Pujols, Cabrera. Um, Have you seen this kid Abreu play? Abreu. Oh, man. You like him? Yeah. Strong. Is Incarnacion playing first base for the Blue Jays? No. no Some. Some, right? By 
by Tejada. One ball, and two strikes. But I'm with you, Joe. When they changed the rules quite some time ago about what the All-Star game is now, they should have changed the rules for how you get them, the players there. Yeah, if it's going to have a sway on where who has home field advantage for the World Series, then let the players have a better say in it. Or pick the best 25 or 35 players. And in my opinion, why does every team have to be represented? Right. Yes. I know it's the fans' game. I get that. We'll make it one or the other. Right. Two and two for Ruben Tejada. And Tejada just missed. It's a full count. So far, Julio not showing any signs of that ball hitting him in the leg bothering him or his right hand hurting too much for gripping the baseball after getting jammed. One thing about pitching that most people don't understand you really can't have too many things go wrong. You can't have blisters, you can't have tightness or obviously cramps in any area because of the moving parts of throwing a baseball. Nothing wrong with that pitch. Tejada chased one up in the zone and he struck out two down. And it really is, it really is kind of amazing when you think about once every five days of percentage of when and how you feel good you know when do you have what is the percentage of breakdown and how many times in your fifth day do you feel like you have your best stuff and it's not as high as you think you know and that's where learning from Greg and, and, and understanding the differences of what makes a great season when you break it down kind of like this you pitch well and take care of business when you have your great stuff whatever percentage that is when you don't have your best stuff, you try to go 500. You just try to break even. DeGrom pops one up into shallow left. And Upton's got that. I want to know what that means when we come back. Three up, three down in New York's fifth inning. Two, three, and four up for the Braves who lead by two. Produced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Atlanta Braves. Time for the home fifth. There's your score. All your long Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. Before we went to break, Joe and John talking about the number of times a starting pitcher has his A stuff. Yeah, of so 30 starts in a season. Yeah, so let's say 35 starts was the norm. You're going to have anywhere between 21 and 24 of where you were going to feel good. You're going to have your best stuff, and you should take care of that, you know, unless your team doesn't score any runs. 
The other breakdown is when you have not your best best stuff. If you can go five and five, six and six, you're going to have a great year. Because to, traditionally, most pitchers, when they don't have their best stuff, don't last as long, and they're going to lose that game or be in position to lose. And I, I found that to be true. Obviously, over the course of your career, when you break down all your starts, not every night you're going to feel like, ah, I got it. This is my best stuff. And you learn how to pitch without it, and you definitely learn how to take advantage of it when you got it. I, I know you and Greg and Tom still have your ongoing jabs at each other though just like when you were teammates it's it still goes on and it's all in in good good fun but I hear you and Tom quite often refer to I didn't really think about that much until Greg Maddox came here I didn't I didn't really factor that in until Greg brought it up to us it seems to me that you guys I know you learned a lot from one another, but it seemed like Greg was a really good influence. Yeah, it's a good teams. balance because you know here you have a right hand pitcher and left hander and me and Tommy for the most part, and then you had Avery and Lee Brandt and Pete Smith a little bit. But these were different theories, and some of them didn't work. You know, for a lot of people, they worked for Greg, and it, it caused you to think differently, and it caused you to ponder some of his. Theories on how he attacked hitters or what he was trying to do in a given year and how he set a standard that was so high It was hard to live up to it was hard for him to maximize every year That kind of stuff deep short to Hada had to reach for that baseball may have thrown off his timing And Simmons legs out an infield hit to strike the Braves fifth and to, to button it up conversely, you know, just at the different time of the year in the postseason, being able to add some things for Greg or talk about some things that were different because in 162 games, there was nobody, period, nobody, right and left combination that were more prepared and better than the hitters over 162 games. There's nobody. I mean, they just did that much better of a job of knowing how to attack a lineup and feed off the ego of the hitter. It was a little different in a condensed series in a best of five best of seven They could take some things away from Greg and Tom that you couldn't take away in a regular season game but It sure was fun hearing different things and knowing what Each perspective, you know, it's like All of us could watch one event and we're gonna see it from different angles and describe it differently sure. That's kind of where Greg was and, and Tommy was and where I fit, I fit in Simmons at first with nobody out. Was there one lesson that you took away from Greg? If you had to pick and condense your experience yeah. with him professionally, what would that one lesson be? Well, because he had so many great years and because he was constantly winning a lot of games, and I remember him talking about defining what a good year and defining them good moments and stretches in baseball. And I remember him saying, remember what you're doing when things are going good because when things are going good you don't take time to even think about it you're just kind of in that zone when things are going bad you overanalyze you overwatch videos you change your mechanics and so i took the heart to that and it just so happened in my year in 96 winning all those games and ended up winning the cy young i took notice of some of those things so i didn't let it just go that when i lost it all of a sudden or got in a funk I was able to recall what was working when it was working and not be so. Runner goes, no chance for Darno. And Andrelton Simmons glides in safely at second. Batting gloves firmly in hand, and he stands there with nobody out. He picked a great pitch to run on. Good crossover step, but the pitch was down and in and in the dirt. Number three for Andrelton. One of those little things that we really haven't talked much about for the Braves offense. And this may surprise some folks, this Academy Sports and Outdoors leaderboard. Look at the stolen base percentage of the Braves. Highest in Braves history, Atlanta Braves history. And that's not just 10 or 15 stolen bases. No. They're racking them up. Braves have stolen 48.
that was a little bit of an emergency swing from Freddie who is trying real hard even with two strikes on him to figure out a way to get Andleton to third base. Another one of those little things that could pay off big in a close game. That might pay off big too. It's launched to center, but Lagaris is there to make the play. Andleton tags and moves to third on Freeman's rocket to straightaway center. And there's the first out of the inning. We showed you Andleton sliding it head first with the batting gloves in hand. And for more on that, let's check in with Jen. Yeah, Chip, I asked Andrelton about that, and he said he broke the bone in his little finger just above his little finger a couple of years ago. And ever since then, he, that's where he got the idea. He saw somebody else do it, of holding those batting gloves in his hands when he's on base. He said, because it gives him a little extra padding. And I said, why don't you just go feet first? And he said, no, I feel like I can maneuver better. I'm faster going hands first. And I know, as a shortstop, I think it's easier to make the tag when guys go in feet first. Interesting. He's using yeah. his defensive theory to justify his offensive theory at the second base bag and stealing bases. Got a bigger target to tag when people go in feet first, that's for sure. I remember when he broke his finger. First year up. Infield in for the Mets as Upton stands in. Justin has struck out swinging twice tonight. I think that's the first time they've gone in on him all night and missed with either a call or a swing. Spots that Jen was talking about earlier that Freddie had alluded to with how the Braves have been doing a great job of getting that guy in from third in less than two outs. Good stop. That saved a run. See if I'm Justin right now and I may get rung up here, but it's a young pitcher. He doesn't want to let that guy in from third base. Doesn't want to give in to Justin, but he just almost threw a ball to the backstop with his slider. I got to figure he doesn't want to throw another one. Yeah. I got to figure as a young guy, he does, may not have the confidence to try that again. And I got to be sitting on the fastball. One thing with that long arm delivery that makes it smooth with the fastball and the changeup. What happens is on that slider slash cutter, he's getting on the side and he's actually getting underneath that pitch and staying staying on top, which creates a different break. Good cut. And it was the fastball. And it's amazing. You can get away with so much mechanically incorrect throwing a fastball. Not saying throwing a fastball where you want to, but you can get away with more because it's just you can overpower. Some guys with velocity, but on the secondary pitches, you've got to be able to be on top and behind the ball and create obviously spin, which creates movement. And if that movement is not in the right level, it sure looks good to the hitter. And he got him with a fastball. Upton strikes out for a third time tonight. And now the Mets infield can back up with Simmons at third and two outs. Well, and this will drive Justin crazy. That's right in his wheelhouse. Struck out with the bases loaded, nobody out in the first, and strikes out with a runner at third and less than two outs. Those are the kind of opportunities for Justin that he usually capitalizes on. So let's see if Atlanta can get another big two out hit. Jason Hayward's one for two, an infield single last time up. Got hit. Hamilton always has good baseball instincts. There's Campbell's nowhere near him at third base. And for Anderton, anything that might bounce away from Darno here, he should be ready to try and score.
I'll give him this. He's been stubborn with the pitch. He hasn't hit with many of them. And again, he's pulling those off the plate, trying to bury them inside. And when that pitch comes around, you're going to see this kid not throw so many pitches, obviously, in five innings, 104 now. But he's been grinding and battling. He was one pitch away from this still being zero runs in the first after he got the bases loaded, nobody out, and then got two outs. His arm action isn't the same, and his arm slot certainly isn't, but he's throughout the game reminded me of Jared Weaver a little bit mm -hmm. in his build, you know, long and lanky. Listed 6'4, 180. That was right by Jason, very late on it. He's actually 6'4, 160, but the hair weighs 20 pounds. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. So it happened to me, kid, and then it all fell out. I hit it just like that. I want to see that picture too. <laughs> Eveland and Herman up in the Mets bullpen. To make pitch number 108. And Hayward fouled it at the plate. Might have chased ball four, but too close to take. Yeah, he's been, again, all game, he's been really good on that side of the plate. I mean, that is where he's had to go for every big pitch and every big out. See if that pays off for Hayward. He likes the ball away. Let's see if they go away again. They did, and it's fouled off the catcher's mask. This was a shot. That ball hit high off the, the screen behind the plate. The umpires have done a very nice job in recent years of giving the catchers whatever time they need to collect. And likewise the players for the umpires. And they went down and into Hayward and Jason couldn't lay off. Braves got a runner to third in the fifth but couldn't bring him home. Good game as we head to the sixth. As he has been for this entire series is Christian Bethencourt obviously just called up in Philadelphia Gerald Laird available we understand though he has been dealing with some soreness in his right side I talked to both of those guys today Gerald said he's just tried to kind of have his door open for Christian as 
anyone who needed advice, questions, Christian could come to him. And Christian told me he has definitely taken advantage of that. And one thing I can tell you guys, I asked Christian how he was holding up. You know, he's gotten hit a couple of times back there behind the plate, catcher's life, I'm sure. And he said, you know, he, he has a hit already, three hits. Well, he also has three new bruises, shoulder, thigh, forearm. He's tough, though. He's, he's toughing it out, looking good out there. Those bru bruises heal a lot faster in the big leagues, Jen. I'm sure they do. I'm not sure who invented the term, but they were right. They called the catcher's gear the tools of ignorance for that very reason. Mask, the shin guard, chest protector, all that padding, and still somehow, some way, the foul ball finds the spot that isn't protected. said that catching is the fastest way to get to the major leagues if you can do it and do it well. well that is not an easy way to make a living. That goes back for years. I remember when Johnny Bench got to the big leagues at I think age 19 and he always said my dad told me the fastest way to the big leagues was to catch if that's what I wanted to do. So that's why I became a catcher. And baseball is the better for it in case of Johnny Bench. Eric Young leads off for the Mets here in the sixth and bounces one foul, two balls and a strike. Made a little mistake on my scorecard. I really need Eric to hit a fly ball to left field. Oh, okay. Because that's what I wrote down in his position, which should have been in the Gromps, right? So I really need. I mean, either way, I got to use white out. So, but he could tighten me up with an F7. Side, three balls and a strike. I can see how you did that though, since DeGrom is like at the bottom of your page mm -hmm. and Eric <laughs> is at the top. Yeah. I can see how that was an easy mistake to make. I'm glad you're on. You understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. In some cases, the pen is the are the tools of ignorance. <laughs> Uh, I'll go home and take notes. Well, I'll tell you what. If he strikes out, he might be able to make that seven F seven into a K somehow. There you go. Oh, he hit it to left, but on the ground. Well, you're messed up now, though. Yeah. So a couple of hits for Eric Young. And the Mets hanging around in this game in the sixth inning bring the potential tying run to the plate. Well, he's the one that got the rally started back in the fourth inning. Now the question that Freddie will be playing is based on when not if when you try a pitch out. You can guess along with the Mets. Young stole a base last time but that was off Tehran. Bethancourt had no chance to get him. Yeah, and he went on the first pitch. So Julio was going to make sure that he at least threw over on the first one. Well, this is a this is a matchup that really was lost in baseball for a long time. Pitcher and catcher versus a fast man at first base. You know that the Mets have scouted Bethancourt throughout the Braves minor league system. They've had scouts, I'm sure, watching him at the big league level. They know how quickly he can catch it and release it. In fact, one scout in this series had him timed at 1.77 seconds from glove to glove. Pop fly foul out of play, even count for Ligaris. One ball, one strike. If you're going to do it, this would be the pitch to do it as far as the pitch out goes. I don't know if they will. But what a speedy runner at first does is also force the hand of a pitcher to probably throw more fastballs than he may want to to a guy because that's going to be the quickest point of getting the ball to the catcher so he can throw him out. But you still can't forget about getting the guy out. So if it calls for sliders and change ups, that's what you have to do. They got him picked off. Young in a rundown. Simmons back to first, and the tag is applied by Freeman. 
Teron didn't have to use Bethancourt because as we know fellas he's got as good a pickoff move as there is in the game and he picked a great time to do it one and one is a great count to do something Joe and uh, look like they definitely were. I thought this was going to turn into one of those Josh Harrison rundowns the way Eric Young was going hard stopped. Good read there by Simmons too to get the ball back to Freddie quickly. So pick off one three six three bases empty now for Lagaris and even count. And a line drive into center field for a hit. Third hit of the series for Lagaris and now Murphy bats. He is struck out and walked. What do you think this guy's worth in the trade market? Well, the problem is, for me at least, team's got to be pretty desperate and need something. But if you're the Mets, I mean, the asking price got to be worth it. Why not just keep him if you're going to build and get to the point where you don't have enough position players already? I mean, it would have to be just a, a ridiculous offer not to include him being one of those guys you would trade. Otherwise, I don't know why you would do it. If you if you void one spot and you get two back. You're still only plus one. There's the Mets need quite a bit, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And I like this guy a lot. And I because he's a solid player and a very good offensive player for a middle infield. And the only way it works for a team that's in this position, unfortunately, is like a David Wright. I mean, he's going to bring you the most. Any guy like you talk, right. talk about the Rays. The Rays have come out of late, but let's say they're going to trade David Price. That's the type of guy that's going to command a lot because he's a difference maker. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Daniel Murphy at this point in his career is a difference maker. He's a great. He's having a great year, but I don't know that you get that three for one. You're going to get four for one for David Price, and if they throw in a Zobris or. Joyce like right. we're talking about that's a difference maker. That's when you look at it and you go you know what we're going to build our future again with some young talented prospects and uh, those trades that's what you have to think about making and I just don't see the Mets being in that position and I agree with you but I'll play devil's advocate with you. Uh, would you say the Mets are more than three years away from being a contending team in the East. Oh I think they I, I agree. I think they're close. You think they're close. I, I, think I do they're closer than that. Yeah. Okay. So then my point is. If you believe that with the Mets, well, let's say you don't believe that, then why would you sign Murphy to a three or four year contract and pay him 40 or 50 million dollars if you're not close to being a competing right. team? If you do, then I think that's where that deal would make sense. But right? all of that's, yeah, all of that's going to hinge on Harvey coming back, right? Wheeler continuing to progress. You see DeGrom, you see Syndergaard, you see some of the arms that they have. They can do what the Marlins were going to do this year and have a vast improvement from year to year if those horses stay healthy. I'm telling you, if Fernandez stays healthy, they're not. Line foul by Murphy down the right field. They're line. not five or six games back. The Marlins. There's no way. Speaking. Yeah, the Marlins. Yeah. There's no way. That's how big a difference a frontline guy that kind of stud can make. Frontline guy can command that. Yeah. Uh, with all due respect to Daniel Murphy, it, it, if it's the Yankees. They're not going to damage their major league club and their chances to catch Toronto by giving up a third or fourth starter or a frontline guy, a major league player. They're going to give up prospects. Murphy didn't get that pitch. Beautiful pitch from Tehran. And Murphy strikes out for a second time tonight. Great arm action. Probably not the perfect location, but the change of speeds was good. But again, play, sitting in the role of devil's advocate with regards to the Mets, they may be a team that, the rare team, that maybe isn't looking for pitching if they decide to trade. They need offense. They need well, that, offensive players. So does that help them get a better player for a commodity that they try to trade? I think they got to go out in the market. If they're going to get closer, let's say it's not next year, 
plan on going and looking at those potential free agents and they got to get another star besides right. He can't do it himself. I think they got to go find one rather than develop them. It doesn't seem like they have them in their farm system. So I've been told. So if you can keep him and you can keep right and you can go out and get a free agent not to stop yet, but actually go out to get somebody to make a difference because they want to play with these young pitchers then I think you're at a place where you can make that huge difference in a year or two. Typically at the trading deadline. It's about teams needing pitching. We got to we need another starter. We need help in the bullpen. I think this year you'll see more teams than usual looking for offense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because teams are struggling so much scoring runs that everybody's going to be looking for that one guy that one bat that and I'll, might help them. And I'll, this is going to sound strange. You might see three guys speaking of offense the irony. You might see three guys from the Padres get traded this year offensively and they're having the worst offensive year a team can possibly have. But guys that may be somewhere else that team might and they're not going to demand much that team might benefit from a Carlos Quinton Seth or Smith. Seth Smith or even. Did they sign Headley to it. Uh, they no they, so they maybe, offered it they offered him a deal he turned it down so maybe a chase Headley. So you, you may actually see that happen I which read, would be ironic and I, I read somewhere yesterday John the Padres are talking about signing Seth Smith to a two year extension. They've already signed Judd Jerko. He's been I'd hurt wait. All year. If I were them, I'd wait till the deadline passes to find out what comes their way. Three balls and a strike for Curtis Granderson. Two outs, two run Atlanta lead, and now two are on as Granderson takes a walk. And Eric Campbell will hit. That's the second base on balls issued by Tehran in the last three innings, and it brings Roger McDowell out for a visit. He's up. You should expect the Braves bullpen. So busy trade deadline, quiet trade deadline. I think it's going to be a weird one. It's going to depend heavily upon, I think, the Cubs and the Rays now that nobody could have saw this coming. The Rays are not the worst team in baseball. No. All right. They have their worst record, but they're not or one of the worst records, but they're not the worst team in baseball. So what the Rays do, what the Cubs do with, with Samarja, who who turned down a big contract. I'm still shaking my head on that. But I think the teams that are at the bottom. That are not going in a direction anytime soon could make the biggest splash and force teams because there are three guys that I can think of. If David Price comes to the top, that he changes the culture immediately. I don't care if you're a third place team trying to get into the wild card or a first place team trying to win the World Series. He's that big of a difference maker. And you worry about him going to team A, B, or C. And if he goes to any other team, then it. But you know if you're the Cardinals and you make that move which most people say why would they make that move they got all the, they have the most young talent to do that to right. absorb it. Mm -hmm. The Yankees of course are always in that desperate plea of. Attracting but I just don't know that that's going to happen in their own division. I just I, think I can't the, see that either. I think the Angels the Cardinals you know have been talk about the Braves possibly um, if things were to work out certain ways but. To me, the way it's set up now with all the wild card and everything being bunched, how can you pull the trigger if you're mathematically kind of in it and explain that to your fan base unless you're out of it? You know, that that you can understand. So it's going to be. You mentioned Tampa Bay. I got ahead quickly. That, that was a key here with. Tying runs aboard, he had to get ahead of Campbell. Campbell's been pretty good at fighting off some pitches, but uh, now he's he doesn't have to throw him a strike. A sweeper right here would be a uh, look at that big breaker. No balls, two strikes for Campbell in the Mets sixth, and it's line just foul. That was a, uh, mm. too good a pitch. I was cringing before it yeah. got there because I, I that's just one of those where it feels good, seems good when you're doing it, but that that allows the hitter to do too much on the ball up there. Up and away is not as effective as up and in or over the middle of the plate. Because up and in, it's just too hard to do something with if the guy's aggressive or up even. 
That was a much better pitch. And they were still trying to go away, but to, to, to the point I was making, that is a tougher pitch. When you're trying to fight off, you don't know. Oh, is it going to be a slider? Is it going to be a breaking ball? I'm just going to battle that fastball. Up and away is too easy to get your bat on the ball. Roller toward third. That's foul. I don't like this guy getting a lot of breaking balls either. That's what he's been doing. He's been kind of he's been fooled, but he's pulled some balls. He's topped them to their dugout to their on deck circle. Now down the line. He seems to drop the barrel on that. That breaking pitch and off speed pitch. Because he's got long arms. Another 0 2. He got him. That baby really swept away from the right hand hitting Eric Campbell. Tehran with his second strike out of the inning strands a pair and maintains a 3 1 Braves lead. Hashtag South Fan Photo for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming broadcast. Brought to you by AT&T. Last time I played this thing way up, I got burned. So I'm just going to low key it this time. <laughs> Wise man. And we hope you'll join us for the Fourth of July weekend here at the ballpark. The Diamondbacks are in town, as you know by now. What better way to celebrate Independence Day than with us? At the ballpark with the best fireworks show in the southeast. For more information, visit Braves.com slash tickets today. Big strikeout for Julio Tehran. He took care of Campbell and the Mets in the sixth inning. They stranded two more. And now Atlanta will feast their eyes on a new pitcher for the Mets. It's right-hander Vic Black. Basically a two-pitch pitcher. Curve ball with downward action and fastball at about 93 over the top delivery. Pretty straight. Pretty good numbers, too. 15 and two thirds innings. Probably a little too high in the walk categories. Hey, to your numbers or to your guy, DeGrom, that you were so impressed with, John. All the runs, all the walks he allowed came in the first inning. Looked like he was about to get out of it. Except for Chris Johnson's bases clearing double, but really pitched well after that and wound up striking out eight. But he's on the short end of the game, and Atlanta will try to keep the good times rolling for Chris Johnson, who's two for two in the game. He's doubled home three, and he's singled back in the third inning. Last.
line or out of play foul. Early in the season, you did not mind seeing the Mets bullpen. They were having some problems down there trying to fill in and replace Bobby Parnell. Tried a whole host of men trying to close games. Kyle Farnsworth, Jose Valverde, among others. That settled down for them. They've done a real good job in relief with a whole host of real big arms. I know one guy down is down there closing for him sometimes and wishes he was a starter. We'll see how that plays out. Kia. He's got really good stuff. Just doesn't feel comfortable in that role yet. His heart's not in it, I would I would think. Some think that uh, and I personally would agree, Familia has closer type stuff. He sure does. Pretty, pretty filthy with his fastball and combination. A little squiver that'll bounce off the side of the mound. A friendly hop for Tejada. And Chris's perfect night comes to a close. He's out number one. There was a lot of talk early on, and Harvey was doing most of it, how his desire was to pitch this year. And I just hope he doesn't. I hope that he's able to hold back the reins and do all the things he has to do to get ready as if he was going to pitch, but then hold off till next spring training. Which is his surgery? It was right? last September. I mean, it was late. It was. It was very late. Yeah, no reason to rush back, even if they were in contention. Tommy Lastella is over two. If memory serves. There was a delay in Harvey's surgery. He was hoping not to need surgery. That's right. Right. So that pushed the calendar back a bit for him. And I tell you, that's the problem today, where we sit. There is no hesitation anymore. There's no willingness to try to avoid it, to rehab it. It's almost as if way back when guys used to pitch with it compromised, maybe a little torn, not completely torn, because it just was worth pitching through. Now, it's almost as if you, even if the hint you need it, let's do it. You're 16, let's do it. You're 15. Yeah, you'll be better. Oh, we're going to sign you in the first round. That's all right. We'll wait. It just has gotten a little out of hand, and uh, we've got to find a way to slow that down a little bit percentage wise. Because I'll tell you what's not translating well is the parents do not understand the disservice they're doing for their youngsters by pushing them and allowing them to throw as much as they are. And having this surgery earlier and earlier is the chances of having a second one go greater and greater and we've already seen that here right sure yeah I'm yeah. always happy to hear you and Tom both get on your soapbox about the abuse of young pitchers arms well the organizations are making a lot of money they're promoting that uh, you know college scholarships are at stake uh, signing bonuses are at stake and parents have no other option other than think oh my gosh I got to get it into this situation or this entity and it's just not true and the blessing of a great arm that comes along at a young age needs to be protected. You can throw all year all for the most part it's all the pitching at the early age that's doing the damage once the damage is done as you get older you know you're you haven't given your body a chance to adapt to it especially here in the south. Tommy was in, in in the east in Boston. I was in Michigan. You know, we had two months of summer. Plus, you're playing other sports. Other sports. You're, you're other counterbalancing sports. your body. You're using cross training to make those things. And I and I I wish I'll never be able to pull this off. But I wish I could take the top 20 athletes, let's just say, in the state of Georgia, and let them take a year or maybe even two from the age of 12 to 14 off of their off their sports. And I will guarantee you. That at 15 they'll be the top athletes still. It's 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 we're just living a, in an era where we think we got to do more to be better, and it's just not necessarily true. And so we got a five to eight year window of tracking this to find out how baseball can look at this and prevent it from being the nightmare that it's turning into with our great pitching in this game. Wow, where'd that get, Darno? Like a big bounce for sure. Right in the center of the chest protector. A 
Base is empty for Lestella. Full count pitch. And he struck out. Black with a 95 mile an hour fastball gets his first strikeout of the night. Off day tomorrow for the Braves. We'll welcome the Diamondbacks to town, as you know. And it's our steal of the week. You can save up to 31% on all you can eat seats. That's $26 savings with an offer that's good tonight only for the Braves and the Diamondbacks series, July 4th, 5th, and 6th. And John, I'm guessing cotton candy would be included if you're interested. So I'm going there. I'm going to have to just hit one up before Friday. I don't know if they know this or not, but the folks at like Chick fil A, they start selling cotton candy. You'd just be, oh. and you'd, you'd bump their overall revenues up by probably five, six percent. You just got to let me know before we go on camera because I'm famous for the blue on the lips or red, whatever it is. <laughs> You're famous for a lot of stuff on camera. <laughs> Line drive headed for the right field corner, but foul. And it's nothing in two. I like Christian swing. I like when you see him hitting the ball that way. We've seen him get a base hit to right field. Finally struck me, Joe, who he reminds me of physically. Remember Derek Lee? Yeah. Yeah. Broad shouldered, long, mm -hmm. lean. First baseman who Played a bit with the Braves. He wore 25 also. It'll be, it'll be hard for me to not see 25 as Jones yeah. for a while. Mm -hmm. No balls, two strikes. And that's cut on and missed. That was 96 and sinking. Vic Black has an uneventful sixth. And off we go to the seventh. Braves three, Mets one. Sweep the New Yorkers out of town. And back to our AT&T U-verse trivia question. Julio Tehran has a 2.34 ERA and 103 strikeouts. Name the last Braves pitcher with a 200 or better strikeout total and an ERA under 2.75. John, I'm just going to stick with the uh, Tim Hudson. I'm going to go back farther. I'm going to. I know Doggy did it, but I just. Steve Avery might be watching, so I just want to throw his name out. And I'm going to say Buzz Capra. I just always like to get Buzz Capra on the air. Let's see if we're right. You guys aren't being team players today. <laughs> that just hurt our heart because that just hurt our, our numbers, our stats. Had to go back a ways to get old Kevin. 
Kevin Millwood the answer. As Tehran goes to work. See this team thing. I think Steve Avery was probably closer to Millwood than Tim Hudson was in terms of year. Year. Mm -hmm. Mr. Teammate. I, I needed to get one wrong after yesterday. That's well hit toward right, but playable for Hayward. And he's got it for out number one. And here's Darno. I'm done. You did it again? Oh, no. I'm done. Oh no. <laughs> score sheet. Just score sheet. It's gonna pout for us again. Got an extra pencil. I know. wrote the Mets side down on the Braves version. Here, well, I'll tell you what, we've got a fresh sheet right All here right. for you. Start. You have to start. Start from the first inning. No, you can just pick it up from here. I don't want to put that kind of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a whole pile of them over here, pal. Right. <laughs> Seventh inning. What happened there? Seventh that inning. That was an F9. F9. Okay. Duda. <laughs> Not down there. <laughs> he almost did it again. Yep. <laughs> Here's Darno. As told you, he started off with the Phillies organization, went to Toronto for Roy Halladay, and then when the Mets in Toronto hooked up in the R.A. Dickey deal, Travis Darno came to New York. He started very slowly at the plate. He's slowly coming on for them. And in our earlier conversation about what the Mets need to do, the other thing, their trades have to work out. This kid is a big part of their future, they hope. No, out of Long Beach, California, and he hits one high toward the left field line. Upton on the run, leaping try at the wall, and he can't get it. I tell you another problem that they have, which you would never guess, would be part of their Triple A is in Vegas, and besides the proximity, as we watch this valiant effort of slowing down and maybe over jumping. And where he thought the ball was going to go. The fact that they can't get guys there quick, but it's it's a misread. You're talking about two total parts of the country, and pitchers are going to struggle out there. How do you identify the hitters? I mean, you're talking about Albuquerque. You're talking about hitter heaven, and some pitchers can struggle, which they have had some struggle over there, because forever it's been Tidewater or Buffalo, right? Yeah. The, uh, how about the weather conditions? Would that be? Uh, part of their thinking they want him to pitch in warm weather. No, I just don't think they've had it. I think they ran out of options where uh, certain leases came up. I think they kind of are in a corner, but it just doesn't his. You know here you got the Braves and Gwinnett. What a great situation, right? You got same kind of climate same scenario and a 20 minute drive and you're called up the proximity of having a team so far out west. Just to me, I, I I couldn't believe it when I hurt when I I just didn't know they were out in Vegas. So back in the days when Pittsburgh's Triple A team was in Honolulu, that probably wasn't gonna. No, it didn't work real well either. It shouldn't. No, it didn't. How many guys were crying? <laughs> I got called up to the big leagues. <laughs> Aloha. I kind of there was a there was a little bit of. Okay, I get this. When it was the Padres, we're in mm -hmm. Honolulu. Yeah. I mean that that kind of worked. How did they how did they do road trips when the team was in Honolulu? It's like a 20 game homestand, right, or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Long trips, long homestands. Baker said they took the plane when they did road trips. They knew he was going to do that, right? I didn't think Tehran was going to walk Darno on a close pitch. And again brings the potential tying run to the plate. How close was this? PNC mm. pitch tracks. He had it. Three walks in June. He's had three tonight. Although the one to Murphy in the fourth inning was one where he just didn't want to pitch to him. Tejada's popped out and struck out. He's over two. Mets have only four hits tonight, but they're still very much alive in the game. Have we seen a double play in this series? 
Yes, the Mets turned one, I remember, because it's deep short. Simmons to Lestella one and couldn't get much on the throw. Tried to will it. There are no forced out at second. Tejada's at first. And the Mets will go to the bench. One each, one double play each. Kirk Neuenheis will pinch hit. Look how accurate that throw was, too, from Anderson. You know, with Anderson, I, I wonder what it's like. I, I'm sure, like any other position, the more familiar you are in a double play combination, the better it is. But he's had to work with a few guys over there at second. Doesn't seem to miss a beat much. I like it when um, when second baseman, even though they know the chances of turning a double player pretty slim, still turn it. Uh, there are obvious times where you just take the out, you get that lead runner, and you get out of the way. But I remember Mark Lemke would, would turn double plays. When you think, why is he bothering? And then all of a sudden, it, he might get the guy or bang bang play because he didn't give up on him. How about that last lollipop breaking ball from Tehran at 69 miles an hour. It was a beauty. He's got new and high behind 0 and 2. He picked a pinch hitter to do it. I don't know if there was some note on him. At 71, and Neuenheis swung right through it. Julio Tehran strikes out the Mets pinch hitter. Tejada stranded at first, and we head to the stretch. Atlanta three, New York one. Here in the bottom of the seventh inning, Braves trying to sweep them back to New York. Our friends at Delta Airlines are proud sponsors of the Braves. We'll be seeing Mac Honey and the gang Sunday after our Braves Diamondback series. They'll take us up to New York, then across to Chicago, and then back home for the 2014 All Star break. On the 4th of July, you can celebrate the holiday with your very own Braves military jersey and special Stars and Stripes on field cap from the Braves Clubhouse store at CNN Center. For more information on that, give them a call at 404 523 5854. New chunker out there for New York. DeGrom started, Black pitched an inning of two strikeout relief, and now Juris Familia is on for his 40th. He was his own worst enemy a couple of nights ago. He's got great stuff, had a great month of June right up until June 30th, and then made a Blunder on a potential double play ball that helped the Braves score three runs in the eighth. 
win the ball game. I guess it's the third time he's had that happen too. It's kind of bit them a little bit more than you would want. And a guy that far, that fast of an arm action, you'll see it when he throws. He's got a fast arm action. When a ball's hit back to him, you don't really need the fast arm action to throw to second. Sometimes you slow down and that messes you up. He spiked it in second base. So the night is done for Tehran. Jordan Schaefer will pinch hit for him. Julio went seven innings of one run ball again for Atlanta. Allowed just four hits. Got him with five strikeouts, three walks, and wild pitch. You just can't find 96, 97 with that kind of movement. Been impressed watching this guy throughout the year develop. <laughs> Schaefer tries to butt, and a good play by Familia. And the 24 year old right hander out of San Cristobal of the Dominican Republic takes care of Schaefer for out number one. Either a little harder or more towards the first base side because the pitcher is going to fall that way as a right hander. And so he kind of fell into that one as he was. Following through and falling towards first base. Your point is a good one. Even though he does fall toward first base, you can still butt on him if you butt it hard enough to get it by him. And that's really counting on Familia last year to be a big part of either their rotation or their bullpen. But he too went under the knife. It's about a year and a month ago that he had right elbow surgery to take out bone spurs and loose bodies in the elbow. He pitched only nine big league games last year. I have to expand my list a little bit. The all relative team. He'd be on it. So with brothers in Colorado mm -hmm. stuff like that. Spanning it. Mets have a couple of guys. Jonathan Nice. Yep. Familia here. One ball, one strike. BJ e. Upton extended his hitting streak to nine games. He singled on the first pitch he saw tonight and didn't like that call from Dan Isonia. Again on our PNC pitch tracks. Well, I'll just say he did not give Julio that pitch an inning or so ago. And that's a called third. No argument from Upton on that one. And BJ is caught looking. And that's out number two. Time for tonight's Home Depot tools from the dugout. As Anderson Simmons steps in. Talked about this earlier tonight. The Braves have definitely shaken up the way they're scoring runs of late. Now how about that? Going 10 and 3 without that many home runs. What is it? Two homers over that stretch? But 42% of their offense came from homers in their first 71 games, and they were only one game over 500. So there's more than one way to skin a cat, and the Braves are catching on. And a line drive by Andrelson on the first pitch. So he has a two hit game. I like what Greg Walker has said about Andrelson and the work they put in with him. He and Scott Fletcher and that is what do you want to be. What kind of hitter do you want to be. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be a guy that just swings in the heels all the time and hits 220 and hits 15 homers to 20 homers. Or do you want to be a guy that's more of a potent part of the offense by using all the field and hitting line drives and hitting 10 to 15 homers. Hopefully and Andrelton will do the latter. And hit for a higher average. Freddie's 0 for 2 with a walk but a run scored. Taken low from Familia. Washington did win their game tonight. They beat the Rockies four to three. So Atlanta has to win tonight to remain alone atop the division. Oh, a nice. 
this stop. Washington beat Colorado 4-3. Well, this is another tough one to block. Good job by Darno. That second one in two innings, it bounced well out in front of the plate. Liner into center by Freeman. He handled a 2 0 pitch. Now Justin Upton looking for a bit of redemption. Jacob DeGrom struck out eight men. He got Upton three times. Top of the order tonight again. Four of the Braves eight hits. And two walks. Two on, two out, two run lead. Boy, this is an area of the game has really changed, isn't it? Guy after guy coming out throwing 95, 96 miles an hour in relief. And fresh, right? For a little while. The rate that they use them. I don't know how many years they'll be fresh. Liner into center. Lagares will get there. It hung up. And that saved the Mets. Justin hit that one right on the button. But the Braves strand two, and we head to the eighth where the top of the Mets order lurks in a two run game. Time for our Coors Timeless Moment. Let's go back to May of 2001. Greg Maddox was the only Braves pitcher since 1919 to record two one nothing complete game shutouts in the same month. Got the Brewers there. Got the Pirates here. Jason Kendall and Aramis Ramirez. Remember them? Old Pirates. I like that. I like that feature. One of the things built into the necessity of the Mets to try to capitalize on some opportunities is knowing how well the Braves bullpen has been working. Anthony Rivaro is the first guy out tonight, but they've been pitching so well that when you only get six outs to work, 
try to catch up and knowing how well the Braves pin's been working, it's not a good situation. No, and this formula will get even better. If they can get, you know, the Braves can get three fifths of the rotation to pitch at least seven innings. It keeps your bullpen fresh. You go to that formula more often. When you have to eat up four innings from time to time, it starts wearing you thin. When you're in a winning streak, you can't go to those guys every single time. So you need your bullpen to pick up some of those other guys. Question we won't know the answer to until we get to the ninth is is Craig Kimbrell available tonight. Braves did activate David Carpenter. He's back from his injury rehab stint. And Carp is available in the bullpen if needed. First things first, you got to get young. And Eric Skies won to center. And Upton gets there for out number one. So maybe Jen has the answer as to the availability of the Braves all star closer Jen. Yeah Chip just following you guys last night you said we should ask Freddie Gonzalez about that so I did before the game today and he said that probably not in terms of Kimbrell being available he said he's never pitched him four times in a row before but not only that because they do have the day off coming off tomorrow he said his workload's just been too heavy leading up to that point I think what was it he pitched in four out of five maybe even more than that guys leading up to this game. Yeah, it actually, you're right, Jen. It goes back more than just uh, three days in a row. So getting two days off in a row would be a real nice thing for him going into the Arizona series. On Lagaris is the batter with one out, base is empty. And he shoots one into right center field. Hayward will try to cut it off, and he will. Good job to hold Lagaris to a long single. Just remember, even in my introduction to the first year of closing, I think 68 opportunities. Of course, it's fortunate enough to get 55, but it didn't slow down the next year. By the All Star break of the next year, it was a record amount of appearances. So I go into that All Star break prepared to pitch the ninth inning. That's when they changed the rules that it counts, you know, the first year that it counts. And Wagner. And Gagne were pitching the seventh and eighth, and I was pitching the ninth in Chicago. Gagne hadn't blown a save in forever, hadn't given up a run in forever, and of course Wagner, dominant left-handed start closer. Well, I never got a chance. We had a four-run lead, and I never got a chance to pitch. Well, what happened there is I went 13 days without pitching, so it went from all these opportunities to too much rest, and I unfortunately ended up. Landing on the DL with tendonitis, but the point is, you never know how the series or the season's going to go, and usually the games take care of itself. But in this case, obviously, it would be another save opportunity. But is it worth for Kimbrell to push the envelope this early when you got so many capable arms? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. And it would appear that Freddie doesn't think so either. I've got Craig with six appearances in his last. In the last 11 days for the Braves. So Carpenter's closed a game or two. Walden has closing experience. So there are options down there. Just got to get there first with the lead as Murphy, a tough out, pops one out of play and is behind in the count, a ball and two strikes. I don't think that's an excessive amount six times in 11 days if it's every other day. Right. Right, but, but the key is again the key is how many pitches each time and this is yeah. a max effort guy This guy's one of the best all right And so if he can keep it between 12 and 15 in the future He will go four and five out of six and six out of eight that that will happen But you got to monitor somewhat the effort in some of those games on the road. He had to get out of some jams Some, some high stress up the middle nice diving stop glove flip to short for the force play a oh, beautiful play Started by Tommy LaStella. Wow. Big hand from the crowd, too. This glove flip wasn't that easy. He made it look like it was just out of his hand. That ball could have gone anywhere. Great glove control. Beauty. Big league play. That's our Zaxby's indescribably good play. And again, Simmons always feels he can make a play with that arm. So two outs for Granderson, and he takes a strike. I, I say again, Chip, that aside from that, I think it was the first game in Boston for Tommy where he 
uh, had a little trouble defensively. He has not shown any signs of weak defense at all. I think we have noticed that Tommy is better to his glove side than his arm side defensively. And showed a lot of range diving up the middle on that play to his right. So that's encouraging too. 0 2 pitch for Granderson. Did he go? No swing. Out of the last six outs that the Braves have to get, this is a big one right here. Tying run at the plate, the guy who's already hit two home runs in this series, and a good fastball hitter. Good try there. There's a hole down, and there's a hole up for Granderson. Both in or part of the plate. There's a sweet spot too that if you miss and don't get it as far down. Loves to pull the ball. Most of his home runs, if not all of them, are going to be right of center. Cranked foul. I agree with you, John, and I because of that, I BJ's got him played pretty much straight away in center field, but I would have to at least be on the first base side a second lined up a little more to right center than to left. You can throw one under his hands right here and bounce it or get it close to the plate after that pitch right there where he just pulled it foul. The 2 2 pitch. Oh, almost, almost. Good try. That has to catch just a little more of the plate to where it looks more enticing and he can't stop his swing after he goes after it. Right idea, though. Ball just started too far off the plate when he released it. Payoff pitch. There goes Murphy. And Granderson didn't get it. Anthony Bavaro out of Staten Island, New York, takes care of the Mets in the eighth inning. Atlanta maintains its 3-1 lead with some terrific defensive help from Tommy Lestella. Weekend begins Friday night. We hope you'll join us on Fox South Friday at 7. And then Saturday it'll be on Fox Sports 1 at 4 Eastern Time. 
And Joe, John, and I are back with you, I believe. You here Sunday? I am not. You're not. Beg your pardon. Joe and I will be here Sunday as we wrap up the homestand with the D backs here at Turner Field. Then we hit the road for the final week before the All Star break. If you're on a winning streak, I don't know if we're going to let you go Sunday. Yeah. Well, I'm a little more concerned about you being here without me. Uh, as promised earlier in the game, we have the AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your fan photo to hashtag South Fan Photo for a chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast. Brought to you by AT&T. Greg Nard. Jason Hayward. Goes to work against Josh Edgen. As the Braves look to extend what is now a 3-1 lead. Jason in infield hit. He's one for three. And that one is well foul. Quickly 0 and 2. Just past 10 o'clock Eastern Time, the Braves scored all three of their runs in the first inning off Jacob deGrom. A three run bases loaded double by Chris Johnson with two outs. Scored BJ Upton, Andrelton Simmons, and Freddie Freeman, who all reached to start the game. The Mets got their run in the fourth inning on a Curtis Granderson sack fly. Tipped and caught, and it retires Hayward. Edgen gets his first man. How about tonight uh, as we get closer to Independence Day? A holiday? Ought to be a national holiday today for that man. That's Walter Banks, the Hall of Fame usher here at Turner Field. Turns 75 years old today. Happy birthday, Walter. Way to go. Who would ever guess that that man is 75? I know our friend Paul Bird is called the nicest man in baseball. Walter Banks would give him a run for that title. He is a wonderful ambassador. For the fans of Braves country. If you get a chance to come to the ballpark and make your way down to wherever Walter is and introduce yourself, your life will be better for the experience. Who bestowed that on Paul? Nobody asked me for my vote. Eddie Perez. Hmm. Swing and a miss. One ball, two strikes. What are you saying? Paul's not a nice guy. Is that what you're meaning by that? Take it to mean anything you want. <laughs> well, we'll get to see Mr. Nice Guy as soon as the Braves wrap up this win tonight. There you go. One and two for Chris. Bouncer up the middle. Tejada, tricky hop. Stayed with it. And got his man two out. So Kimbrell's not up in the Braves bullpen. Laser Baker tells us it's Jordan Walden loosening up. He will have five, six, seven hitters on the Mets lineup card. How you doing on your new scorecard there, John? Uh I, I, I just gave up. Yeah, I gave him another one. Be honest. I got professionalism left of me. I got professionalism right of me. If I need any, I just look either way, and I got the answer I need. Got some behind you too, Val and Dave Cool. But they're not keeping school. Oh, yeah, they. Oh. Please. Val doesn't even need a score sheet. She's married to a scout, so it's like all right there. 
That man's going to sleep well tonight. Uh huh. Wonder what the umpire asks him after he takes a foul ball like that to the mask. I mean, is there some protocol that the umpires are asked to follow? I wonder. And I'm sure you stood in the box after a catcher's gotten whacked with a foul ball and asked, hey, are you all right? But that was a lengthier conversation than that. Yeah, he might have been administering the test. I can remember a time or two where it happened and the umpire would go around and maybe brush off home plate and then just say, you okay, meet? <laughs> really? You know, when we like started holding the game up. We started having to fill out, you know, that that test, that pre-concussion test, right? Guys failed that before they got a concussion. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you draw a baseline on that? And now Terry Collins is going to come out. Edgen walks Lestella, and he doesn't want the lefty-righty matchup. And it's like Curtis Granderson's going to come out of the game from right field for New York. So Henry Mejia is going to be the man that comes on to pitch. We'll tell you about the other switch for the Mets. Yo, K. Meat. Huh. All those minor league gums must have been related to Mike Kruko. We're back to Atlanta in a moment. to extend what is now a 3-1 lead. From Little League to the Major Leagues, join us for a front row seat into the life of Braves all-star closer Craig Kimbrell as he becomes the franchise's all-time leader in saves. It's driven Craig Kimbrell, the closer. Set your DVRs for Friday night at 11 Eastern on Sports South. Double switch for the Mets. Chris Young takes over in right field. He'll bat ninth on the New York lineup card. And take a look at Henry Mejia. Now you see the amount of innings. He's got a few starts under his belt before he went to the bullpen. A lot of walks. A lot of base runners. 28 walks, 58 hits, and 58 innings. They moved him to the bullpen May 12th after seven big league starts. He's had a rough time of it of late. He's allowed six earned runs in his last 10 outings. That covers nine innings and two thirds. And ball slider curve. Sorry, Chip. And in his last five outings, two saves, a hold, and two no decisions. So he needs a little work. He hasn't pitched since June 28th. So Christian Bethencourt greets him first, but time called. And Murphy in for a, a chat.
he also out of the Dominican Republic. He'll be 25 this October. He's another Met that had bone spurs removed from his elbow last year. His surgery was August 28th. Ground ball to short. And flip to second will send this game to the ninth inning. Jordan Walden was loosening. He'll try to come on and save it for Julio Turan, who's three outs away from his eighth win. Deliver us from evil by Georgia Power, by the Home Depot, and by Zaxby's. Indescribably good. Joe Simpson, John Smoltz, Jen Hildreth, Chip Carey from the ballpark. We head to the ninth. The Mets three outs away from being swept by the Braves at home. And Jordan Walden's the man that will try to slam the door shut. Certainly a guy that's not strange a stranger to this situation when he was with the Angels back in 2011 which was really his first full year in the big leagues 32 saves and a 298 ERA and 62 appearances. Yeah it's there's no doubt he has filthy stuff and certainly when healthy it really gives the Braves they, they have so many options. That it's got to be a luxury when you're in the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth with the lead. It's a pretty good feeling. Jordan's last save was June 20th at Washington. He worked a scoreless inning against the Nats. A breaking ball froze Campbell, who looks back. Strike one. Three holds and a no decision after that save on the 20th for Walden. He has struck out nine men in his last five outings, including the side on the first. No one, two. Just wondering about Tommy Hansen, who the Braves traded for Jordan Walden, and Gretchen tells me that he is in AAA with the White Sox at Charlotte. After starting the season in spring training with Texas. Fighting off heater.
Braves trying to send the Mets 10 games back in the division. Braves are also hoping to stay a half game ahead of Washington. They won 4 3. Braves are winning 3 1 tonight in the ninth. And Walden off to a good start. High fastball got Campbell to tip it into Bethancourt's glove. One away. And I'll tell you what this run does, and as well as Washington winning this run, and as much as they can take care of business before the All Star break, gets them closer to having some cushion in case you get to the end of the year and you just happen for one reason or another not win the division. Now you start throwing yourself back into that wild card option. We all felt there for a while that the way each team was going, the only the winner was going to be a recipient of the playoffs. Good point. So even though you want to keep your lead against Washington, who won again, you want to also make sure because of the wild card situation, throw your hat in there as well. Yeah, keep improving your record. Fly ball to left off the bat of Duda. And Justin puts that away. There's out number two. Well, the schedule for the Braves is certainly favorable. If you look at who the Braves play leading up until the end of July, got some clubs that are having tough years. Mets, Diamondbacks, Cubs, Phillies, Marlins, and Padres. Then you face the Dodgers for the first time. So the opportunity is there for Atlanta to really, as you guys said, improve their record. And they're standing in both the division and wild card races. I know the final hope for New York and down a strike. Yeah, because August is anything but a cakewalk. August is going to be a tough month. Well, every team seems to have that one month where they can make hay. And this is definitely a good opportunity in part of the schedule. I'll tell you who's done it and sneaking up. June was moving month for the Pirates. They got back into it. Cincinnati too. And Cincinnati. And we'll see both of those clubs next month. One more strike to get for Jordan Walden. And he just missed the corner. Off. Irvin Santana and Josh Colmenter will pitch on the 4th of July in the Braves Diamondback Series. Crowd tonight on its feet, ready to head home. 2 2 pitch. See another. There's your ball game. Jordan Walden takes care of business in the top of the ninth inning. The Braves have indeed swept the Mets. It's their sixth series sweep. And Atlanta is continuing to roll. They're 11 and 3 in their last 14 games and have won their last seven in a row. Braves 3, Mets 1. We'll recap it after this.